Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled Themes from the Gospel of John. This is lesson number five in that series for November 2 of 2024, entitled The Testimony of the Samaritans. The Testimony of the Samaritans. Hmm. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we try to look through the Gospel of John once again and consider some themes, some over overarching ideas that are presented here, may we grasp them, may we realize their importance, and may we apply them to our lives as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson will focus on in this intention in interaction with the Samaritan, Jesus and the Samaritan, by starting out with the woman at the well and the other Samaritans who she encouraged to listen to Jesus. Jim? From the Bible Study Guide. Who were the Samaritans? The northern kingdom of Israel had been taken captive by Assyria, by the Assyrians in 17, excuse me, 722 BC. To create political stability, the Assyrians dispersed their captives throughout the empire. Likewise, captives from other nations were brought to populate the northern kingdom, and these became the Samaritans, who practiced their own form of Judaism. Let me just add a little bit of something there before you go on. The, they believed, most of the religions in ancient time believed that gods were assigned to a particular territory. So when you, you move big populations of people around here, the people who got moved to northern what used to be Israel, northern above Judah there, the northern kingdom there, they said, who's going to teach us how to worship the God of this place? Yeah. And the, actually the whoever, and I wasn't Sennacherib, but one of the uh, leaders over there said, to actually contacted the people from Israel and said, where are some of your priests can come and teach these people how to worship your God? And it is hard to tell, but they got some people who came back from captivity back to to the northern kingdom of, of uh, Israel and started teaching these people. Of course, they had already come with all their pagan ideas. And so what you end up was a mishmash of pagan ideas with whatever those guys came back with from where they had been, which. But what year was that? 722. So that was before Ezra, wasn't it? Oh yes, way before Ezra. Just couldn't help it. Uh, people around Lake Genesaret all believed that winds and waves were gods. So here is Jesus sleeping, mm -hmm. and the disciples said, they're going to die, right? They're all gonna, they're scared. They're fishermen. He stands up. He says, "Be quiet. <laughs> Peace be still." Right? So this guy said, "Who on earth is this man?" Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and when he spoke in, in Genesis 1, let there be light. Yeah, there you are. And let there firm, be a firmament, so person. on and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Relations, however, were not good between them and the Jews. For instance, the Samaritans worked against the rebuilding of the temple at the return of the Jews from Babylon. The Samaritans, meanwhile, had built their own temple on Mount Gerizim, but this temple was destroyed by the Jewish ruler John Hyrcanus in 520, excuse me, 128 BC. This is from the Bible study guide. So we're real friendly relationship between these <clears throat> two nations. So what do we know about Samaria and the surrounding area? Just a little bit of geography here. Well, I will learn as we go here. Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel throughout the monarchy, period, renamed uh, Sebaste. Sebaste during later Roman rule. In the New Testament, mentioned only in, a f in the stories from Philip, preaching in the city in Acts 8, 5 to 13, and Peter and John confronting Simon the magician in Acts 8, 14 to 25. Then Shechem the oldest city in this region, CA 
about, established about 2000 BC. That's a long time ago. Uh, destroyed in AD 67, archaeological site of the Tel Bath. Belata. Belata today, about a mile east of Nablus. Nablus. I'm sorry, I'm just not good with names. Uh, mentioned 68 times in the Old Testament, especially in Genesis, Joshua, and Judges, but only twice in the New Testament in Acts 7, 16. Okay, then we come to Sychar, which is our main topic now. Okay, Sychar, a small town, city town near Jacob's Well, near modern Nablus. 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 Name is possibly a Greek version of the ancient Hebrew Shechem. In the old whole Bible, mentioned only in John 5, 4, 5, so he, Jesus, came down to the Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob was given, had given to his son Joseph. And that's the next verse there. Oh, okay, then verse 6, Jacob's well. Jacob's well was there. And then we move on to Mount Gershom? Gerizim. Gerizim. I knew that. High mountain in the region of Samaria, mentioned four times in the Hebrew Bible. Okay. And Deuteronomy 11.29, When the Lord your God had brought you to the land that you are entering to occupy, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Yeah. Deuteronomy 27. Now, let, let's just talk about for a second. I don't want to take a long time, but they marched, the children of Israel marched right in. I mean, this is their first, they've just entered. They just conquered Jericho, and then they had a little fiasco with uh, Ai, and then they just, Joshua's told, just march right into the middle of the country, park yourselves between these two mountains, and what one, one mountain is going to be for blessings, the other mountain is going to be for curses. And they, the six tribes over here and six tribes over there, there they are in the middle of this, <laughs> somebody else's country, basically, shouting at each other across this valley. Oh Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, 12. When you have crossed over the Jordan, these shall stand, shall stand on Mount Gerizim for the blessing of the people. Simon, Levi, Judah, Ishar, Ishar. Issachar. Oh, okay, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. So those were the blessing tribes. That was the blessing tribes. Joshua 8, 33, all Israel, alien as well as citizen, with their elders and their officers, their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark in front of the Levit Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord half of them in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at first, they should, be, should bless the people of Israel. Now I'm going to interrupt again for just a second. You notice it says the other mountain that's mentioned there is Mount Ebal. The, the Hebrews pronounce that Ebal. And just recently, someone has found an altar on the backside of Mount Ebal that they positively identified with stuff and so forth in there from Joshua, mm -hmm. from the very time when this we're reading about right here. They've just found some, some stuff from that, from that very time. That's interesting. Okay, go ahead. Judges 9, 7. Uh, when it was told to Jotham, he went to t and stood at the top of Mount Gerizim and cried aloud and said to them, Listen to me, you lords of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. Hmm. Not mentioned directly in the New Testament, but probably the mountain referred to by the Samaritan woman and Jesus. John 4, 20 to 21 says, Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where the people must worship is in Jerusalem. Okay. Jesus said to her, Woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Okay, what was the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans? We already have a, a bit of an idea about that. Go ahead, Gordon. 
from the Bible study guide, the Samaritans were despised by their Jewish neighbors. I think they both despised each other. Yes. The Jews despised the Samaritans even more than they despised their Roman oppressors. The Samaritans were viewed as corrupt, insincere, and to be avoided at any cost. That is why travelers from the region of Galilee avoided the shorter route to Jerusalem via Samaria and instead detoured through Perea, taking the longer route to the city. <clears throat> the Samaritan problem started when <clears throat> Tiglath Pileser III, 745 to 727 BC, took most of the population of Israel as captives to Assyria to settle there. These Israelites comprised what are known as the 10 lost tribes of Israel. To complete this work of depopulation, and again, this is what we read before, yeah. the new Assyrian king Sargon II, uh, 722 to 705 BC, exiled even more of the inhabitants of the Northern Kingdom. <clears throat> to unify the Assyrian Empire, people from Assyria and the Mesopotamian regions were brought into Israel to repopulate it. Thus these newcomers mixed with the remnant of Israel, both religiously and racially. The outline here is but a brief overview of the events that transpired. Other negative incidents that occurred later on, such as the Samaritan attempt to sabotage the rebuilding efforts of the Jewish exiles when they returned to their country, only served to compound the problem and intensify racial tensions between the Samaritans and Jews. And then later the Jews destroyed the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim. Okay, basically the Jews and the Samaritans had been at war since the second century BC and had been hostile for centuries before that. So we see a, we have a nice friendly kind of situation here. <coughs> After kind, that- Kind of like today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. kind of like the populations there. Yeah, I just read in one of the newspapers that every, every country in the world thinks that the two, two nation status, you know, Palestinians have their nation, the Israelites have their, their nation, is the right answer, except for the Palestinians and the Israelis. Yeah. <laughs> the people involved. Yes. At, at this time, wasn't the Israel and Judah side by side? And yeah. they were at war all the time. But there must have been a lot of mixtures, a lot of people that were... Yeah, probably. There was intermarriage, mm -hmm. maybe not, it wasn't approved of, but there you yeah. go. So yes. it was a big mess. But doesn't this speak of the kind of picture they had of their Heavenly Father or whoever they worshipped? I think about To a considerable extent. Yeah. So this is background. After that background, we, can't, we turn to this lesson. People are beginning to compare the progress and results of John the Baptist's ministry with that of Jesus and his disciples. So... Okay, for so John 3, verses 26 through 30. So they, meaning John's disciples, went to John and said, Teacher, you remember that the man who was with you on the east side of the Jordan, the one you spoke about, well, he is baptizing now, and everyone is going to him. Oh, boy. John answered, No one can have anything unless God gives it to him. You yourselves are my witnesses I, that I said. I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. The bridegroom is the one to whom the bride belongs, but the bridegroom's friend, who stands by and listens, is glad when he hears the bridegroom's voice. This is how my own happiness is made complete. He must become more important while I become less important. That's from the American Bible Society. Okay. Yeah. So now we get right into our story of what happens here, Lorna? Uh, John 4, 1 to 4. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was winning and baptizing more disciples than John. Actually, Jesus himself did not baptize anyone, only his disciples did. So when Jesus heard what was being said, he left Judea and went back to Galilee. On his way there, he had to go through Samaria. Okay, so we talked earlier that most of the Jews didn't do that. They, they went around, but he said, no, from, from where they were, where it was located in Judea, to Nazareth, where, which was his hometown, is a fairly short distance right through Samaria. So we're going to go right through Samaria. As Jesus saw these tensions developing, he decided it would be better to leave Judea for a while and return to Galilee. 
The most direct route was through Samaria, but most Jews did not travel through Samaria because of the animosity between the Jews and Samaritans. However, Jesus had a mission in Samaria. He had a woman to meet and a town to convert. <laughs> okay, pretty straightforward, huh? John chapter four, verse uh, five through nine. In Samaria, he came to a town called Sychar, which was not too far in the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tied up by the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw some water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink of water. His disciples had gone in town for food. Goodness Bible. Okay, and I will tell you that many years ago, my first visit to Israel, which had been 1970, some early 70s somewhere, I had the privilege, my wife and I had the privilege of going to this place and drinking from that well. Mm. Yeah, I don't think you can do that anymore. At least it's not very friendly. So they had tried to maintain it, so there was some sort of maintenance probably to keep that functioning. Yeah. Do you think it was really the same well, or is it what they called? They claimed Tradition. it was. Tradition. They claimed it was. It looked, it looked sort of like, well, it looked like the pictures you can look up online, for whatever that means. Well, Jacob's well was located right next to Shechem, while Sychar, where the woman was from, was about a mile and a half, a mile away, about 1.5 kilometers. Jesus sat by the well while his disciples went into the city to buy food. He had no access for, to the cooling water of the well. When the woman came to draw water, he asked her for a drink. From our Bible study guide. Jesus interacted with the Samaritan woman by asking her for a drink of water. And again, carrying on with this story, Jim. John 4, verses 7 to, seven to 9. A Samaritan woman came to draw some water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink of water. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The woman answered, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan. So how can you ask me for a drink? Jesus then, excuse me, Jesus will, you, excuse me, Jews will not use the same cups and bowls that Samaritans use. Oh, this oh, good news, Bible. So this is a even worse case than the, the Gentile thing that we've talked about so many times. Or drinking uh, yeah. black fountains in, in the South years yeah. ago. Yes. You know. yeah. It's very interesting to compare this one-on-one -on -one encounter with the woman at the well in Samaria with his one-on-one -on -one encounter with Nicodemus, a Pharisee and one of the Sanhedrin members and a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus came at night to find Jesus, hoping to avoid discovery. A Samaritan woman went to the well in the middle of the day, trying to avoid contact with other human beings, especially other women. So here he is. Jesus is meeting two different people in very different circumstances who are both trying to stay away from other people. Okay, Myra. Uh, the Bible study guide says, in John 3, it was surprising that Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews and a rabbi, would lower himself to, go, to come to Jesus. He came by night to avoid discovery. But in John 4, the woman hides in broad daylight, perhaps avoiding contact with other women who came either at the beginning or the end of the day when it was cooler. We can relate to that today. Mm -hmm. After all, why did she go such a long way to fetch water and in the middle of the day when it was hot? Whatever the reason for her being there, Jesus, meeting Jesus would change her life. So, and, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Okay. The scene unfolds next. What scene unfolds next? The Jewish teacher is compared to a Samaritan woman of poor reputation. What a contrast. And yet, in this exact context, a remarkable encounter unfolds. What are some of the taboos in our own culture that would hamper your witness to others? How do we learn to transcend them? Bible study. Okay, would we dare to talk about any taboos? Do you? Have some to suggest. Well, there's lots. Of do you? 
would you be happy to go and try in the evenings in a gang infested area to try to do some witnessing? Well, that's a safety issue. Okay, safety issue if you want, yeah. Well, it's probably a safety issue for the woman Perhaps. too. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Taboos, what's your favorite yeah, well, taboo? What if uh, someone walked into a church and uh, well, the woman decides the uh, woman is known by everyone in this church, a uh, uh, bad reputation. I will tell you a brief story. There was a very staid, conservative Christian church in a certain place. Everybody always came in dressed just right and all that kind of stuff. And there was a there was a, a basically a tramp um, who was living in that area, and he was around asking people for food and this kind of stuff. And one, this was a Sunday, one Sunday he came into the church and he walked right down, the preachers already started preaching. He walked right down the aisle, all the way, like, and sat on the floor right in front of the preacher. And everybody in the, in the church is going, what's gonna happen next? Whereupon the old older deacon from the back of the church just walked right down the aisle and sat down on the floor beside the man. And everybody went, oh. Make him, com <laughs> make him feel comfortable. Make him yeah. feel comfortable. Beautiful. Exactly. I, I'm concerned that we leave it by our cultural beliefs that this was a woman with a bad reputation where her choices were not the choices I have today. I can have five husbands. My friends might not approve, and I might be <laughs> might criticized, <laughs> but I could make that choice. Yeah. She may have made none of these choices. She may Possible. have five husbands because her father sold her five times, or he wanted her to marry the, she probably had no choices. But I'm not necessarily that means a woman of ill repute just because she had five Husband. Well, it's, to me, that doesn't one, quite equate. Wasn't her husband. Did. But was well, the last choice. one. But I mean, the five husband yeah. doesn't necessarily mean she's questionable. I mean, there's all sorts of, we don't know enough about this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, theoretically, all, four of these husbands could have died. Well, five of the husbands could have died cause, because it says she's now living with someone who's not her husband. Yeah. And we probably wouldn't approve of that. Yeah. Well, are there places you do not go or do go because of special beliefs? Are you afraid to attempt witnessing in some places? You bet. Yeah. How can we overcome these prejudices? Reading again the description of the start of Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman, and I, I, let me just say one more thing. Um, there was a time when I work, was working on my master's degree in public health in a city on the eastern coast of the United States, and we, uh, my wife, my children were very young, wife had to take home, stay home and take care of them, so we had to live for a whole year on savings that we'd put together. And we had just come back from living in Africa, so you know we didn't have a huge lot of savings. And the only thing that was available, was even close to our price range, was in a completely black community in not very far from my school. And a lot of people have had, would have had a problem with that. We actually moved in there and it was just perfect. There we got to know the people there. And <laughs> we went back there a little while ago, many, many years later. We just drove up just to look at where our house used to be and everybody's, what in the world are you doing here? The times have changed. Yes. So who's next? Gordon? John 4, <clears throat> 7 to 15, and reading the start of the story again. A Samaritan woman came to draw some water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink of water. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The woman answered, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan. So how can you ask me for a drink? Jews will not use the same cups and bowls that Samaritans use. And then continuing, Jesus answered, If only you knew... Mm what God gives and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you life-giving water. Sir, the woman said, you haven't got a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get that life-giving water? 
It was our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well. He and his sons and his flocks all drank from it. You don't claim to be greater than Jacob, do you? <laughs> Incredible Jesus, idea. Jesus answered, all those who drink this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will be will become in him a spring which will provide him the life-giving water and give him eternal life. Sir, the woman said, give me that water. Then I will never be thirsty again, nor will I have to come here to draw water. It doesn't say it, but and face the women that come here too. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Larry? Okay, from the Bible study guide. Water is necessary for life. Humans cannot exist without water. And so water can be powerful and appropriate image of eternal life. As well, hence Jesus says, whenever, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life from John 4:14. 4, okay, so to if we were back in that society, our minds would probably jump to a couple passages in the Old Testament where it talks about that kind of water. Arna? Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two sins. They have turned away from me, the spring of fresh water, and they have dug cisterns, cracked cisterns, that can hold no water at all. And Zechariah 14.8, When that day comes, Fresh water will flow from Jerusalem, half of it to the Dead Sea and the other half to the Mediterranean. It will flow all the year round in the dry seasons as well as the wet. There you go. Bible. Everlasting water. The water that Jesus was talking about with the Samaritan woman was on a whole new level. Later at the Festival of Lights, Jesus made this kind of declaration about that water. I have a question. Yes. Did the woman know who Jesus was? No. No idea. Other than he was a Jew. Yeah. Other than he was a Jew. And she spoke to him very bluntly, you know, saying, why, yeah. you know, are you asking me, a Samaritan, and for a woman to question mm -hmm. what a man is asking of her at yeah. this time? I, I just am curious in how she would understand that this life-giving water was eternal life? Well, probably not. Obviously, she, I don't think she thought so at the beginning because she said, just give me some of that and then I won't have to come over here and right. draw water out of this well. But she got the message after a while. It's, it says to me how compelling and how winsome Jesus was. He, yeah. he could talk to somebody and they were convinced that what he was saying was true and they, you know, she was very impressed with him. She believed him. It Whatever he said, I'll, I'll try to understand it. <laughs> it helped for Jesus to know what that person was like, mm -hmm. to be able to know her motives, her thoughts, her, her history, her yeah. desires, her history. Yeah. yeah, everything about her. Yeah, he didn't just pick some random person. Obviously, no. he and his father had talked. Okay, what, Charles. We, we, what, we flew over something so precious and dear to me. I want to go there. John chapter 4, verse 14. Oh, throughout the world, and I travel quite a bit, uh, we have millions of believers who are rice Christians. It's mm -hmm. very sad, very, yeah. very sad. I, it's hard to criticize, but what attracts these people to Christianity, to Adventism? Or give me rice Christianity in general. Yes, I mean the and rice Christians. I wish our people. I'm the I'm pastor's son. I wish our people, uh, our leaders would say, you, uh, the, the 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 most unloving promise of the Lord is, you follow me, and you're going to be hated of all nations. Yeah. Matthew, make, John, make Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. Oh, wh wh what is this? Why don't we talk about it? Uh, yeah, yeah we, we join Christianity because then we can get the rice or whatever. It's, it's not a, it's, it's not. It's sad. 
It's not a favorite message. <laughs> I, I think we need to bring it up. It's about I'll, time that I'll we... I'll tell you, we, we need to... We, let me just tell you how the update of that is. Go for it, sir. In Africa, where I worked for many years, when the AIDS epidemic hit, the big nations stepped in and said, well, we, prov we will provide food for these people of AIDS. So there were some people actually contracted AIDS because you could go to the, to the health center once a month and get a huge bag of, in this case, it's cornmeal, um, that otherwise you couldn't grow yourself. I mean, they thought that getting AIDS was a good idea. Oh, because of the service, you know. Service. Okay. Where are we? John 7. John 7, 37. 30, 37, 37, 38. 7, 37, uh, John 7, 37, 38. On the last and the most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said with a loud voice, whoever is thirsty should come to me, and whoever believes in me should drink. As the scripture says, streams of life-giving water will pour out from his side. Now, this is the second time Jesus has basically said something like that to somebody. That seems strange to us. I mean, <laughs> what did they think he was saying? What did, they think Jesus, what did they think Jesus was talking about? What do we think Jesus was talking about? Well, Ellen White had some words, interesting comments about Jesus' opening wedge in the case of this woman. She says, the hatred between Jews and Samaritans prevented the woman from offering a kindness to Jesus. But the Savior was seeking to find the key to this woman's heart. And with the tact born of divine love, he asked, not offered, a favor. The offer of a kindness might have been rejected, but trust awakens trust. The King of Heaven came to this outcast soul, asking a service at her hands. He who made the oceans, who controls the waters of the great deep, who opened the springs and channels of the earth, rested from his weariness at Jacob's well and was dependent upon a stranger's kindness for even the gift of drink of water. Wow. Hmm. Of course, one of the... Desire of Ages. Yeah, Desire of Ages. 183. Of course, one of the advantages that Jesus had that we do not have, that Gordon mentioned a moment or two ago, was his ability to know in advance the details of each person's life, thoughts and motives. He knew the story of Nicodemus and he knew the story of the Samaritan woman. Jesus did not waste time on these occasions. He went straight to what he knew was the important thing that needed to be talked about for that individual. When looked at this when looking at this story, we might think that this is the first time God had specifically offered water to an individual. But, of course, he provided water to the entire Israelite nation for 40 years out there in the wilderness. More than that, he offers to give this spe very special kind of water to all of us. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, I will sprinkle clean water on you and make you clean from all your idols and everything else that has defiled you. I will give you a new heart and a new mind. Who's doing this? God himself. I will take away your stubborn heart of stone and give you an obedient heart. I will put my spirit in you and I will see to it that you follow my laws and keep all the commands I have given you. So how does God do that? I mean, shouldn't God just do that to everybody? <laughs> Well, let's take another passage from Jeremiah. This is a famous one, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I, notice once again, I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Does this mean there's some faults in God's memory? No, it's no. choosing. <laughs> okay. We cannot choose to forget. He can, and he does. 
Who is doing the active things in this passage? The Lord Himself. It's important to realize in these two paragraphs from Jeremiah that it was God who was and, I might add, still is acting. So when God says, I will no longer remember their wrongs, it isn't that He forgets no. or that He has a bad memory. I, he says He won't hold it against them. He will not yep. bring it up. <laughs> It is obvious that neither Nicodemus nor the woman understood at first what Jesus was talking about. So each of them tried to change the conversation. What Jesus had suggested seemed impossible to them. Then Jesus touched a tender spot. Suddenly, the conversation had become very personal. Reading again, John 4, 15 to 18, Jim. Sir, the woman said, give me that water. Then I will never be thirsty again, nor will I have to come here to draw water. Go and call your husband, Jesus told her, and come back. I haven't got a husband, Jesus, she answered. Jesus replied, you are right when you say that you haven't got a husband. You have been married to five men, and the man you live with now is not really your husband. You ha have told me the <laughs> truth. Good news, Bible. I mean, try to imagine this woman. Here's a completely strange male. She's, he's not only not a Samaritan, he's a Jew. And he's telling her about her history. And she's, she must have gone into apoplexy almost at that point. Nobody's, nobody's supposed to know this. Yes. And he didn't have the internet to do that searching. No, he didn't. No AI, nothing like that. Okay, Myra? John 4, 19 to 24. No, Ellen White. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. E. I, Wood, I yeah. skipped uh, the part from Desire of Ages. It says, Jesus now abruptly turned, turned the conversation. Before this soul could receive the gift he longed to bestow, she must be brought to recognize her sin and her Savior. He saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. She answered, I have no husband. Thus she opened to prevent, she, she hoped. hoped to prevent all questioning in that direction. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Little did she know. Uh, but the Savior continued, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for you hast had five husbands, and he whom you now hast is not thy husband. Oh, I can't read the Old English. In that saith thou truly. That's from Desire of Ages. Jesus opened her to receive the gospel by that very personal conversation. And now we can move on, Gordon. John 4, 19 to 24. <clears throat> I see that you are a prophet, sir, the woman said. My Samaritan answers, ancestors worshiped God on this mountain. And that was the Mount Gerizim we talked about earlier. But you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where we should worship God. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time will come when people will not worship the Father either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Where else is there? Yeah. yeah. You Samaritans do not really know whom you worship, but we Jews know whom we worship because it is from the Jews that salvation comes. Wow. Talk about uh, inflammatory Egotist statements. <laughs> But the time is coming and is already here when by the power of God's Spirit, people will worship the Father as He really is, offering Him the true worship that He wants. God is Spirit, and only by the power of His Spirit can people worship Him as He really is. Good News Bible. So Jesus took a moment or two to discuss the differences between the way the Samaritans were worshiping and the way and the person that the Jews supposedly worshiped. Then the conversation took another turn. So John 4, verses 25 and 26. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah will come, but when he comes, he will be tell us everything. Jesus answered, I am he. I who am talking with you. From, also wow. from the Good News Bible. <laughs> wow. I mean, this woman has had a few shocks already, hasn't she? Yeah. What a revelation. Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah to that Samaritan woman. Anna? In the Bible study guide, it says, in all four Gospels, this is the only passage before his trial, just before his crucifixion, in which Jesus plainly stated 
to someone that he was the Messiah. And he did it not to some large crowd or important personage, but to an unnamed Samaritan woman alone at Jacob's well. He is interested in, in a lonely soul who feels separated. And so to this woman, who not only was from a foreign culture, but also was not of the highest moral character, Jesus openly revealed who he is. And having revealed to her his knowledge of her darkest secrets, he also gave this woman a good reason to believe in him as well. What should this story tell us about why the gospel needs to break down the barriers that we humans create with each other? One of the huge barriers that we have that I wish we could do something about, and that's the language barrier. Wouldn't it be nice if we had the power that the apostles had to speak fluently in any language wherever we go? You and think that's, it's going to come and happen fairly soon? I think it sure could. I think it probably will. Will it be the gift of tongues or the gift of ears? Some of both. There's a, an awful lot of people who understand English these days. Yeah. What barriers exist in our world today that make it hard for us to witness to certain groups? And we just talked about language. That's one of the things. <clears throat> what was the woman's response to hearing that Jesus was the Messiah? When the disciples returned, the woman dropped everything and went to a town and started evangelizing. Instant. Instant. <laughs> just like that, she's, she's an evangelist. She, yes. Mm. John chapter 4, verse 28 to 30. Then the woman left her water jar and went back to town and said to the people there, Come and see the man who told me everything I have ever done. Could, be, could this be the Messiah? So they left the town and went to Jesus. Goodness Bible. Um. Notice that she didn't just say to them, I have found the Messiah. She asked a question that suggested that they should investigate for themselves. So this reminds me a little bit of the, <clears throat> how long the demoniac, the demoniacs had with Jesus before they became missionaries. Exactly. This woman had a few minutes maybe with yeah. Jesus and she's off evangelizing. The demoniacs she's probably questions. had part of a day at least. Yeah. It's his in, Bible study guide again. It's interesting to note that the tasks that she intended to accomplish were left undone. She was supposed to take a jar of water to her village at Sychar, but in her excitement about her amazing discovery of the water of life, she left the filled water jar behind. She meant to give Jesus a drink of water to alleviate his thirst, but she failed because she, but she, failed because she left in such a hurry. When Jesus' disciples came back with the food to alleviate, alleviate his hunger, they were utterly surprised that he was not hungry anymore. I'm glad John mentions that she left the jar there. Yeah, from our Bible study guide, again, the teacher's edition. Ellen White says, Jim. The woman had been filled with joy as she listened to Christ's words. The wonderful revelation was almost overpowering. Leaving her water pot, she returned to the city to carry the message to, the other, to others. Jesus knew why he had gone, why she had gone. Leaving her water pot spoke unmistakably as to the effect of his words. It was the earnest desire of her soul to obtain the living water, and she forgot her errand to, to the well. She forgot the Savior's thirst, she, me, which she had purposely had purposed purpose. to answer, supply. When the heart overflowing with gladness, she hastened on her way to impart to others the precious light she had received from Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 191. How important to us is the opportunity to witness to others? Is it more important than eating or drinking? It was to Jesus. We do not know what the effect of a single witness might be. Ellen White? As soon as she had found the Savior, the Samaritan woman brought others to him. She proved herself a more effective missionary than his own disciples. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The disciples saw nothing in Samaria to indicate that it was an encouraging field. Their thoughts were fixed upon the great work to be done in the future. They did not see the, that right around them was a harvest to be gathered. 
but through the woman who was despised, a whole city were brought to hear the Savior. She carried the light at once to her countrymen. This woman represents the working of a practical faith in Christ. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. The grace of Christ in the soul is like a spring in the desert, welling up to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink the water of life. Okay, now I, I'm going to ask a practical question here. Do you know any people, including yourself, that are welling up with this kind of living water and it's just spreading out to everybody around them? I think we need to pay attention to her. What did she do, this evangelist, an early mm -hmm. evangelist? She went and asked a question. She mm -hmm. didn't come with a prepared sermon. No. Nope. She didn't come with movies and she, videos. She didn't have the 20 lessons. She didn't have the 20 lessons. And she hadn't even taken the 20 lessons. <laughs> well, she went back to town, to a town that she was avoiding yeah. because of what they were talking about her and lost that fear and spread the word. Yeah, she was so, she was so excited about what she had just heard that she didn't worry about the reputation, didn't worry about any of those things. Guess what? Something became more important. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe that day is not too far. Yeah. It's coming. Well, let's see, who's next? From the Bible study guide, this simple woman, a sinner with a dubious character, was entrusted with the weighty truth that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. The Savior gradually led the Samaritan woman to the truth culminating in his honoring her more than anyone else before his resurrection with a specific truth about his messiahship. I who speak to you am he, that is the Messiah. Likewise, he must not show favoritism in reaching people. We, we must not show. Likewise, we must not show favoritism in reaching people, be they wealthy or poor, of higher or lower social status. Such distinction should not matter to us because it did not matter to Christ. Mm. All with whom we come in contact have one common denominator, their need of forgiveness and redemption, from the Bible Study Guide. This woman responded to what was to her a complete stranger, but of course, Jesus knew all about her. She was not a stranger to him, but <laughs> she was, he was a stranger to her. Yeah. Well, it would be wonderful if we had a way to transport ourselves back into that environment and understand exactly what was going on. Even today in the Middle East, asking for a favor is like opening a door to friendship and requires the receiver to return the favor. And what yeah, did... I, yeah. so tell a short story. We were in Lebanon with some, with some friends many, many years ago. And my parents said, oh, what a wonderful looking, you know, brass vase. And they said, oh, I must give this to you. Yeah. They had, they had to give it because they had admired it. They didn't know that that was the rule, but yeah, that was the rule. Yeah, we had experience a little bit like that with some Palestinians whose family we had worked with, or we had known anyway, and worked with a little bit in Zambia. And went there, and they, oh, you ha if you get to Israel, you have to visit our family there. And, okay, and they were they they tried to give us a half a dozen different things, and we, you know, what do you do? You don't want to offend. No. Yeah. no. I don't have room to pack it. <laughs> yeah. And what did the woman do for Jesus? She got the water from the well for him. Okay, the Bible study guide. Jesus was deeply moved that such a despised woman opened her heart to him as the long-awaited Messiah, a much better response than from many of his own people who closed their minds to him. So moved was Jesus in doing his Father's work in reclaiming lost souls for the kingdom of heaven that he lost his bodily thirst and hunger, sated as he was in his soul, the heavenly water and nourishment. 
This is from the Adult Teacher's Guide. Right. For now, we will skip John 4, 31 to 38 about Jesus' conversation with his disciples. We'll get to that later. When the Samaritans were willing to listen to Jesus, he spent two days in that Samaritan village. How do you think his disciples felt about that? They learned something. <laughs> they, they were shocked. <laughs> Let, let's, let's hope I'm that... I'm sure they were uneasy. Yeah. This is not okay. what but we're supposed to do. They didn't talk to him and give him a scolding. Peter would have... No. They, they knew they were out of line. Yeah. <laughs> were any of them uh, concerned that when they got when the word got out that they had stayed in the Samaritan village, they would be despised? They'd have to go through the ritual purification. Something, <laughs> for sure. Okay. Lorna, I think you're next. John 4, 39 to 42. Many of the Samaritans in that town believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they begged him to stay with them, and Jesus stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his message, and they said to the woman, We believe now, not because of what you said, but because we ourselves have heard him, and we know that he really is the Savior of the world. That's incredible. I mean, and these are Samaritans. I mean, where, where are the Jews who are doing this? Were the Jews who were responding like this? Yeah. Okay. In the culture of the Jews in Jesus' days, there was an obligation to reciprocate hospitality, which was acceptable when the reciprocator was a fellow Jew, but not when he or she was a Samaritan. Receiving a favor and reciprocating is tended to draw people closer to one another. For this reason, the Jews were totally against the practice of forgiveness foreigners with the foreigners. But Jesus transcended the national prejudice of the Jews, for he came to minister and to save the high and low, both within and without Jewish society. Furthermore, why would such a societal obligation bother him when his mission was to go to extreme extent for a dying humanity. Wow. Bible study guide. Jesus practiced reciprocity in his ministry. He, for he was willing to give and receive help. Such an approach is an effective way to validate others and help them to feel worthwhile and needed. Contemplate how effective this approach proved to be with the Samaritan woman. I, I, when I read this story, and I almost said something about this earlier, how many of the people in Sychar had some information about her background? <laughs> probably a lot. It's probably the news of the day. You know? yeah. Probably quite a few, and they said, wow, if Jesus knows this about her, what else does he know? <laughs> you know? Certainly all those ex-husbands knew. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jesus asked her for a simple drink of water, which she which she could provide, and he reciprocated with the gift of the water of life, which he alone could give. Then the woman, in, in turn, shared the good news with her people, and the entire town came to meet Jesus and to believe in him. I looked up online a picture of, this, of Sychar. What's left of it is just a tiny little bit, of almost nothing. And I don't know whether it was a bigger city or bigger place or something back in Jesus' day, but didn't amount to much, and though it, it certainly doesn't amount to much now. I think the interesting comment is that it wasn't because of what she said to them, they went out and dug it out for themselves. So mm -hmm. I think that was an important comment yes. there, that, mm -hmm. that, you know, learn this for yourself. Don't just believe what other people are telling you. Go out and, and search the Bible yourself. Yeah. But she provoked or incited or whatever the word would be, yeah. the interest in them yeah. to go and look, to go and, and search. Considering her background, they might not have expected her to always tell the truth. Mm. Yeah. But apparently it was enough to get their attention on this occasion. Sometimes we think of Jesus as being not really human, but he longed for human tenderness, courtesy and affection, just as we do. He approached the Samaritan woman asking a favor. 
I guess that's mine. Though he was a Jew, Jesus mingled freely with the Samaritans, setting up, setting at naught the Pharisaic customs of his nation. In face of their prejudices, he accepted the hospitality of this despised people. He slept with them under their roofs, ate with them at their tables, partaking of the food prepared and served by their hands, taught in their streets, and treated them with the utmost kindness and courtesy. I will have to say, I took on the job of being the medical director for the clinics in Tanzania many years ago. And many of those clinics were in very rural areas, almost hard, some of them hard even to get to by road. And I would go there and I would help them and I would see some patients if they needed me to see patients. And then I would say, okay, I want to stay here tonight. I want to sleep with you and so forth like this. And As an outsider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, they, and they, after it happened to him once or twice, they, they really appreciated it. But at first it was sort of, oh, <laughs> you know. and they didn't have facilities. I mean, it, it were places where I had a piece of tin sheeting with a bucket and a, a piece of soap. That was the way you got your shower. Okay, he accepted the hospitality of the despised people. He slept with them under their roofs, etc., partaking of the food prepared and served by their hands, taught in their streets, and treated them with the utmost kindness and courtesy. And while he drew their hearts to him by the tie of human sympathy, his divine grace brought to them the salvation which the Jews rejected. Ken, do you want to sum up what we have in the last few seconds? Okay, well, yeah. We have looked at the experience that Jesus had with this woman and this village in Samaria. He was in the process of teaching his disciples that Christians are supposed to break down all barriers. He went to them, he stayed in their place, he, 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 he knew how to reach across barriers. Uh, obviously he knew this woman's story, which we wouldn't know. We would have no way of knowing that. But he reached, a, by, by, that was one of the ways he sort of opened the door and, and found his way into uh, their situation. Um, that's what we can learn about this story. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to have your message, messages, plural, in these stories and begin to realize what you want from us in this same context. May we learn these lessons to break down barriers is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.